Well, welcome everybody to the Human Ecology Project and I could spend the next hour alone just telling you about some of the wonderful achievements that this man of truth, Dr. John McDougall, has achieved. But he has a very important presentation to be sharing with you all, so I'm going to keep it short. John McDougall's national recognition as a nutrition expert earned him a position in the fantastic Great Nutrition Debate of 2000. Now that was presented by the USDA and I am going to post the link because I encourage every one of you to watch this. Dr. McDougall, I'm sure you know, but if you don't, he know, is an amazing board certified internist, author of 13 national best-selling books, co-founder of the McDougall program, and this man has dedicated over 50 years of his life caring for people with diet and lifestyle medicine. And Bill and I are so blessed to have this expert as one of our friends on our Human Ecology Project Advisory Board. And all I can say is you're in for an absolute treat. So, Mr. Tara, over to you, please. Yes, very happy. Lovely to have you here, Dr. McDougall. Um, Thank you. Uh, it, it, as, as many of our friends will know, uh, Dr. John McDougall has been a champion of, of, of healthy eating, both for individuals and for the planet, for the better part of his lifetime. Uh, and he's recently been uh, awarded the Luminary Award by the Plantarian Education Series. And uh, we're, we're very happy that you got that award for yourself. And he's going to be talking tonight about some of the things that have been most on his mind lately, um, particularly about not only diet, but he's also very interested in the climate issue and, and the relationship between those two things. And so I'm going to pass it over to you, and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Oh, well, thank you. Nice introduction. And uh, what I want to do is I want to share with you and, uh, and our audience uh, the 55 years that I've spent in the medical business. I've learned a lot of things. You know, some people call me a renegade. I would rather you think of me as a, a conservative medical doctor. You know, I'm not an alternative medicine doctor. I don't prescribe supplements. I just do standard medicine, except for the fact that I don't treat dietarily caused diseases with drugs and surgery, except as a last resort. What I do is I deal with the cause of the problem and the cause of the problem is the food. It's been a, a long journey for me to get to where I am. And I hope you'll bear with me and I'll share with you some of the things that have happened to me over the last 47 years that I've had a primary interest in diet for people. And over the 18, last 18 years and for the planet. Yes. And of course, we'll get into that as we move through the presentation. <laughs> All right, good. Okay, well, I, I, I was uh, raised in a middle-class family in uh, Midwestern United States in a state called Michigan. And fortunately, I had some great parents uh, that supported me and convinced me I could pretty much do anything I wanted to do and gave me a, a Creole to live by. And that is, they said, uh, you got to tell the truth, John. No, no matter what you do, regardless if you tell the truth, everything will be okay. And I was a very mischievous young man as I grew up. And so this served me well. And it serves me well today. Is What I'm going to do is I'm going to try and tell you the truth as I see it in terms of, uh, first, my patient's health, and then we'll get into what I think will be the future. Now, I've spent nearly six decades as a physician. So I feel like I've earned the right to talk to you about the past, present, and future. You know, I've lived it. Uh, I believe in it. I've spent my whole life studying it and coming to conclusions that I hope you can relate to. Uh, my first experience with the medical business was when I was 18 years old. I went to college at Michigan State University and ate uh, the dormitory food with enthusiasm. And I completed closure of an artery in my brain and as a consequence, I had a complete left-sided paralysis. In other words, I had a stroke. I had a stroke at 18 years old. It only happens to about a thousand teenagers in the United States a year. They have strokes and heart attacks. And, and I wasn't a very famous person, so I didn't get a lot of attention. 
but I did get some attention. I got to learn a little bit about the medical business. Um, in my family, in addition to teaching honesty as one of the primary principles, we also revered physicians. They were next to God. And I didn't even feel like I had uh, any possibility of that kind of an aspiration in my life. I was just a regular old person. But at 18 years old, I uh, spent two years in Grace Hospital, in Detroit, Michigan, where they uh, looked me over, did a whole bunch of serious tests. And uh, during that entire two weeks, they didn't really answer my questions, which were three in nature. There are three things I ask all the doctors who came to see me. And there were a lot of doctors who came to see me because I was a curiosity. What's wrong with me? What are you going to do for me? And when am I going to go home? And instead of uh, providing me some very well-researched and optimistic messages, they just shook their heads with no answers. And I said, heck, I could do that. So I left my freshman year at Michigan State University, and I went on a track to become a medical doctor. I wasn't in very good health back then. As you can see, I smoked cigarettes. I did a lot of things that didn't support good health. After uh, three years, four years of uh, medical school, I went on, or excuse me, four years of undergraduate school, I went on to my medical training. And by the way, that's, that's the time I met my wife, who's been my partner for the last uh, over 50 years. I met her at Grand Rapids, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, at Blodgett Hospital. Uh, she was a nurse, and uh, I was a medical doctor. Excuse me, I was a medical student at that time. And uh, we got together, uh, developed a relationship that's lasted, as I say, over 50 years. But at that time, I had a visitor come to Blodgett Hospital that changed my life. Uh, his name was Dennis Burkett. He was a uh, surgeon who was trained in Edinburgh, Scotland. And after his training as a surgeon, he went to Uganda, Africa with some of his friends, Clive, Troll. Walker. Uh, these three young doctors, uh, they went to Uganda to, to help the people in Native Africa. And uh, what Dr. Burkett told me during this one-hour new time conference, and, and believe me, he was, as far as I was concerned, he was just talking to me. I, I was totally focused on every word he had to say. What he told me was that after heading the Ministries of Health of Uganda for 17 years, after having overseen 10 million people, uh, overseen a thousand hospitals, he told me that he didn't see any obesity among the rural Africans in Uganda. He saw no hemorrhoids, no colon cancer, no breast cancer, no prostate cancer, no deep vein thrombosis, no pulmonary embolus. He saw one heart attack and that was, that was in a, uh, a judge who went to train in London and, of course, ate the, uh, the typical Western diet and came back and had a heart attack. In 17 years, overseeing 10 million people, he saw one case of gallbladder disease. And he told me this was due to the diet that people ate in rural Africa, which was a diet based upon various starches, underground starches, uh, similar to potatoes and grains and so on. Now, that was their basic diet with fruits and vegetables and very few animal products. In other words, a low, cho low cholesterol, low fat diet. If you look at the, the diet of disease of the countries throughout the world who don't get the common diseases of Western culture, and when I say the common diseases, I mean diseases like atherosclerosis, diabetes, gallstones, bowel cancer, breast cancer, hemorrhoids, varicose veins, and particular disease, huge pile of stuff. The countries who don't get these diseases have a diet with far more starch, far more fiber, far less fat, far less sugar, far less salt. And the two major things we need is to eat more fiber and less fat. So what Dr. Burkett was describing was a diet based on starch with the addition of fruits and vegetables and a diet that was uh, was not heavy in animal products. As a matter of fact, they had 
very few animal products at all in their diet at that time. But this wasn't unique just to rural Africa. This is the kind of diet people followed all over the world. In, in Asia, you can relate to this, people lived on a diet primarily of rice, but they also at times lived on sweet potatoes and buckwheat. If, if you come to uh, North and South America and Central America, you see examples. For example, the Mayas and Aztecs in Central America were known as the people of the corn. For 1300 years, it's documented these people lived primarily on corn as their food. They were a very successful society, fought wars, participated in athletic events, raised families. If you uh, take a look at uh, people from South America, you're looking at folks who lived in the Andes and potatoes were a dominant food in the Andes and still are today. Uh, these people, and the classic example of these people would be the Incas, and their primary food was potatoes, except for when they went to battle because potatoes were so heavy because of their high water content, they switched to quinoa to fight their battles. If you go back to Europe, uh, in Europe, you have an uh, area known as the breadbasket of the world, which includes Iraq, Iran, Egypt, and now in Ukraine, they talk about it being the breadbasket of the world. What are they talking about? They're talking about wheat and barley being the primary starches of these people. And so it was around the world. The food for people in most areas of the world was primarily starch, rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, various kinds of grains and root vegetables. And that's how people thrived. Animal foods were a small part of the diet, except for the extremes of environment. The extremes of the environment, such as the Inuit Eskimo. They lived on a diet primarily of meat, but that was because of their environment, because of the strenuous, the cold, the availability of animal products in this small isolated population of people. And there are a few other examples I can give you, but the statement I'll make now is all large successful populations throughout all of verifiable history have obtained the bulk of their calories from various starches, minimal animal products, of course, minimal processing. And that's what uh, Dr. Burkett taught me is that there was a, another way of eating which would make a difference as far as diseases worldwide. And so I remember going home that day and talking to my soon-to-be bride, Mary. I, I told her, you can't believe what I just heard today. I heard how important it was to eat fiber in your diet. Of course, fiber is only plant, present plant foods. So the message I picked up initially from Dr. Dennis Berger was that I should eat more fiber. And so I told Mary, I said, from this day on, I would like to have brown bread instead of white bread with my bacon and egg sandwiches. I mean, that's all the dietary change I had made by that time. Finished medical school, went into a surgical residency at the University of Hawaii. And from that surgical residency, I got a job in Hawaii as a sugar plantation doctor. And I left my surgical residency. I spent three years taking care of 5,000 people on the Big Island of Hawaii on a sugar plantation. And that's where I learned basic medicine. I took care of these 5,000 people with all kinds of needs that they had. I caught 100 babies. You know, I had to do brain surgery that, that, that was needed as a result of, of injuries, of trauma. I mean, I basically was the doctor for these 5,000 people. The nearest specialist was 41 miles away. And the conclusion I came to about myself as a medical profession professional is that I wasn't a very good doctor. You know, my patients just didn't seem to get well. I gave them all kinds of pills, sent them off to various surgeries, and they never seemed to get well. And I blame myself. Because at that time, I was educated as to what a good doctor should be by television shows like Ben Casey, Marcus Welby. These are the people that were ideal doctors that taught me what I should be doing. I should be curing the vast number of patients I was taking care of. Marcus Welby, Ben Casey, Dr. Kildare. I was not performing at all like these medical doctors on TV were. So I felt like I needed a better education and after three years of being a sugar plantation doctor and feeling disappointed in my skills, I returned to 
get some more training to take a university medical residency training. But before I left, I made one other observation that was very important. And that was, I was taking care of first, second, third, and fourth generation, Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans. These people or their ancestors had moved from their native land to Hawaii to start a new life. Well, they had learned a basic kind of eating before they left Japan or the Philippines or China. And they preserved that kind of eating pattern when they moved to Hawaii. And so the first generation maintained a diet primarily of starch, rice in this case. Their kids, they were influenced by Western teachings, Western restaurants, et cetera. So as a result, they switched from rice to more processed food, oils, and animal products. And they got a little, little more overweight, a little sicker. By the time I got to the third generation, I was looking at some of the fattest, sickest people I'd ever taken care of because they had thoroughly embraced the Western diet. But the first generation was still alive. They were thriving into their 80s and 90s. They were working hard. They were trim. They avoided the diseases that were so common in our societies. But they were quickly picked up when the eating habits of their descendants changed. Nothing else changed. Genetics didn't change. They had the same basic genetics as their grandparents and great-great-great-grandparents and so on. Kind of work didn't change in, on the Big Island of Hawaii. What changed was the food. So I went back into training because, as I mentioned before, I thought the problem was mine. I didn't get an ad adequate education. So I wanted to learn how to be a really, really good doctor. So after three years, uh, I quit a job that I was making $17,000 a year uh, doing, and I took a job that I was making $12,000 a year doing. And at that time, I had a, a wife and two kids. So it was a pretty big sacrifice for me to go into training. So I went to the Queens Medical Center in Honolulu, Hawaii, and uh, did my three years of internal medicine residency, but I had some free time. I worked really hard, but I had some free time. And I spent that free time at the Hawaii Medical Library. And what I quickly discovered is that my observations were not unique. You know, thousands of other scientists, observers had seen what I had seen, and that is that people, until they became modernized, were trim and healthy and avoid common diseases. And they lived on a diet primarily of starch, rice, corn, potatoes, beans, peas, lentils, sweet potatoes, wheat, barley, breads, etc. cetera. That, that was the diet of the people who were trim and healthy. And, and they'd also observed that when you switch to a rich diet, one typical of Europeans, now people in Asia and people in the United States, you switch to a rich diet, you become overweight and sick for a very basic reason that we've seen for thousands of years. Rich people who eat rich foods end up overweight and they develop pretty typical diseases that are known to be pandemic in today's society. These are the kings and queens of the old. I, I can go back three, four, 5,000 years. And then I can talk to you about the royalty of Egypt. The, the priests, the priestess, the kings and the queens and the pharaohs whose bodies were preserved for two, three, four thousand years. And as a result, when they were examined, they were found to have diseases typical of people in Western societies. They had terrible atherosclerosis. Some were overweight. They had gall, gallstones. They had birth defects that are a consequence of eating the rich Western diet. Rich foods make people sick. The difference is, is back then there were only there were only a few rich people. What happened was uh, we had the Industrial Revolution and the harnessing of fossil fuels in the mid 1800s, and what was once uncommon became common. That is, the the common person could eat the rich Western diet, and you've seen the change that has occurred over the last forty to fifty years. Within your lifetime, you've seen this. So in the process of my medical residency, I ran across one of my other mentors, and that was uh, Nathan Pritikin. I hope you're familiar with his work. If not, here are some references to the scientific literature that I'd like you to look up and get to know Nathan Pritikin. 
Uh, this man made a difference in the diet of human beings worldwide, not just in the United States. And he told us a similar story about people eating a starch-based diet, but under different circumstances. When we, when we learned about uh, Dr. Burkett, we learned about people who had been following a starch-based diet for thousands of years. It was their preferred way of eating. There was no possibility of them eating otherwise. Now, what we're going to hear from Nathan Pritikin is we had to return to starch-based diets, but we didn't do it by choice. We did it because of circumstance, and these circumstances could well occur again. Let's take a look at what uh, Nathan Pritikin observed that tells him the rich Western diet is what causes the diseases that are so common today, and the fact that these diseases can be cured with a change in diet. But remember, this change in diet was forced upon people in Europe. When I saw what happened after the war, and I began to see that it was only the fat and cholesterol that seemed to have made the difference, I then started to investigate countries around the world that were on a very low fat and cholesterol diet. In fact, I looked at the range of the world's population, and I picked out countries on the very lowest fat and cholesterol intake. And I was amazed to find that there were 25 populations I was able to study that heart disease practically didn't exist. There's no heart attacks in the country? No, unheard of. You couldn't find a case to show to a medical student. It's amazing. And not only heart disease, but diabetes, hypertension, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, arthritis, glaucoma. That's all, all I treat as a doctor. <laughs> Where are all these diseases? Uh, and these were uh, under hundreds of millions of people. And here I thought these were the natural, inevitable consequence of aging, and that everybody has to die of one of these diseases. And now I find that populations don't die of those. They actually die of old age, which is unheard of in this country. This is the published data that Nathan Pritikin is talking about. You see in uh, Western Europe, uh, this example on the left is Norway, you see, prior to World War II, the incidence of heart disease, death from heart disease, is increasing. Then the war started in Europe, and uh, food scarcity was common. And as a result, people could no longer eat the butter and the milk and the cheese and the eggs. They had to switch back to a starch-based diet. And you see a dramatic reduction in the death rate from heart disease. Well, similar things occurred with other problems that are related to the rich Western diet such as autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis, and metabolic diseases such as diabetes. And you see here another example that includes both of the wars, both World War I and World War II, where it looks at the incidence of diabetes in England and in Wales, and what you see is a dramatic increase in the incidence of diabetes, which goes along with the increase in obesity that was occurring prior to World War I, the war came along, food rationing became common. People had to switch to a starch-based diet and hopefully they had enough food. And chronic diseases related to eating rich food decreased dramatically. In other words, they healed, they regressed. Or, or you might think of it as they were cured because they stopped the cause of the disease, which is the rich food. And then good times returned, as you see here in the 30s, and we had another war in Europe. And as a result, food scarcity became common. People had to eat starches. They couldn't eat the animal foods. And the incidence of disease dropped drastically after World War II. And of course, they've returned to the good times these days in Western Europe and across the world. The pretty good uh, program developed uh, some very important concepts and provided research that confirmed these observations. Uh, these are the results from uh, Nathan Pritikin and his group, which talks about the changes that they observed and published in the scientific literature. And I encourage you to look up the scientific studies and uh, make them your own. You know, understand that when he under controlled circumstances, and that's the, the Pritikin program, the live-in program that he ran, there was a Dramatic reduction in diabetes, the need for diabetic medications, the same reduction was seen for high blood pressure, 
and uh, the the reduction in blood pressure lowering medications that he was able to accomplish, as well as cholesterol and triglycerides. They made a tremendous beneficial change in these risk factors in a short time. This program's lasted approximately a month. You have a lot of controversy surrounding you, and a lot of people uh, uh, would like to see you fail, I think. There's no question about that. You are sort of a lone person standing up there giving a different message for people to follow, and you have quite a following. I'm not alone anymore. I think if I would disappear from the earth today, the movement would grow, and uh, it's, it's too late to stop it. And, you know, the movement has grown. That's why we're sitting here talking today. Uh, people all over the world have uh, come to a similar understanding. But unfortunately, this understanding is not shared by health organizations, by doctors, hospitals, governments, et cetera, around the world. They seem to be content with the current circumstances of people dying of common chronic preventable diseases that are caused by what they eat. Now, I was so excited being a medical resident about ready to start my practice. I thought that once I understood this, all I had to do was share this with people in power. And once they understood this, they would uh, make necessary changes. And my patient population was to grow dramatically. Now I had envisioned that somehow or another, there would be a five mile long line from the Honolulu International Airport to my office in Kailo, Hawaii. And you know what? These patients have never appeared. Oh yes, we run a very successful program, but not, not the change in diet that should have occurred as a consequence of knowing some simple, basic truths. Another one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Roy Swank, he was the head of neurology at Oregon Health and Science University for 23 years, uh, published extensively in the scientific literature about the treatment of autoimmune diseases. And here are some of his research I gathered together for you, for you to look up and study Dr. Swank's accomplishments as far as stopping a disease called multiple sclerosis, an autoimmune disease. But he wrote some important things in his career. And back in 1959, let me read what he said. He said, gluttony and chronic degenerative diseases have been linked in the minds of both laymen and scientists for many years. The saying to dig your grave with your teeth probably has its origins in antiquity. But in the prosperous areas of the Western world during the past few decades, the maxim has taken on real and tragic meaning. 1959, think about it. His patients were placed on diet beginning actually in December of 1948. And uh, as I saw patients, they were added through the years. Uh, one of the first things we noticed was a marked decrease in evasion per year per patient. <clears throat> During the first year, there was about a 70% reduction in exacerbations, and in the next two years, about 5% each. And we published our first paper long about this time, at which point there was an enormous in decrease in exacerbation rate. We've continued to follow the diet for 16, I mean, followed the exacerbation rate for 16 years, came down to a level which was about a reduction of at least 95%, and stayed down there during the 16 years, and has continued to be that way. So you have a rapid drop in exacerbation rate, and uh, followed then by a very low level of, of exacerbation going on for years. Well, this, this mentor of mine, who became a good friend of mine too over the years. He showed us something that's really important to understand, that is the body quickly heals. In a matter of, of days, it begins to show evidence of healing. In a matter of uh, weeks, uh, dramatic changes take place in people with all kinds of problems, including autoimmune diseases. It's important for us to realize that the body never stops healing. It is always trying to survive. 
the, the problem is, is that we introduce injury at an intensity at a rate that the healing processes can't keep up with. And so disease progresses. And so the solution to diseases caused by whatever, including diet, are to stop the sources of injury. And as a consequence, people naturally heal. And again, I want to emphasize that they've never stopped healing. It's just that we've changed the equation by stopping the damage. And the response is quick and easy to see. Uh, Walter Kempner was the fourth of my more, most important mentors during my career. Uh, Walter Kempner was brought from Nazi Germany in 1934 to Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. He started the uh, rice diet in 1939 at Duke. The rice diet consists of rice, fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar. He practiced during the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And in fact, it was the most successful program at Duke University for two decades. Important things that I learned from Walter Kempner is that I learned the power of diet therapy. I saw tremendous benefits occur quite quickly in his patients. And I realized what could be accomplished with this tool. And he showed me that nutritional deficiencies do not occur on simple plant-based diets. Uh, he fed a diet of white rice, fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar with a few vitamins to his patients with remarkable recoveries. Here are some of the research papers that Dr. Kempner published, and I'd like you to take the trouble to read them. Before I was born in 1947, Dr. Kempner had disproven concepts held by physicians today. Yes, physicians in Europe, the United States, and all over the world today, they believe diet has little to do with heart disease, that more protein improves health, and that carbohydrates cause diabetes. The scientific literature clearly proves that all of these statements are incorrect. If you look through the publications of Dr. Kempner and the Rice Diet at Duke University, You'll see some amazing results that any physician would be proud of to see in their patients, that any drug manufacturer would be thrilled if they had a drug that caused these things to happen, but they don't. Uh, massive obesity, morbid obesity, he was able to cure with this type of program. Diabetic retinopathy, you see the picture in the center frame. You see the white exudates on the left-hand side of the fundus. This is the back of the eye. You see the white exudates and the red flame hemorrhages. This is uh, blood vessel changes that occur throughout the entire body. You look in the eye to see them. These occur in the kidneys, in the skin, in the brain, every place. And he changes people to, to his diet, the Kempner diet. And in a matter of just a few months, they show healing, reversal. That occurs again, not just in the eyes, but throughout the entire body by stopping the repeated damage, in this case from the Western diet. Tremendous drops in blood pressure in his patients. These patients have really high blood pressure. We call it malignant hypertension. Their blood pressures are so high, they're having strokes and heart failure and so on. He would take these people with malignant hypertension, not the usual kind of high blood pressure that most people in Europe or the United States have, but you know, from all over the world, the sickest came to see him. And he was able to get 60% of the people down to a normal blood pressure with his approach. He showed you could reverse atherosclerosis, blockages the arteries. Back in the 1940s, he showed this. You see the electrocardiogram back in the, in the bottom left-hand corner. The, the first set of strips indicates a low blood supply to the heart muscle. And a few months later, what you see is that the flow of blood to the heart muscle has returned. It's now being properly oxygenated. And so you see the change in the shape of the rhythm strip from what we call ST depression to a normal ST segment, proving that you could reverse atherosclerosis in the 1940s. Here's a patient with severe kidney disease that's dying. She's 11 years old. 
put her on the Kepler diet, her kidneys healed. Again, the healing takes place for the entire body once you stop the damage. And he took care of patients with such severe heart failure that their hearts were enlarged when you took a chest x-ray to the point where they filled almost the entire cavity of the chest. Benefits were universal and expected. People lost the weight. Blood pressures improved. Heart size decreases. Cholesterols dropped. Tremendous healing took place once you stopped the damage. And that, that's what it was primarily for, stopping the damage, because again, this is simple, basic nutrition of rice and fruit and fruit juice and table sugar and a few vitamins. And we spend most of our time blaming sugar as the problem for people in modern societies. Sugar is not health food. Rots the teeth, raises triglycerides, and provides empty calories. But people misinterpret simple sugar for complex carbohydrates like potatoes and rice and so on. Plus, they put the evidence of the most serious damage on things like sugar as opposed to animal foods, which is where they should put their attention. We had an important document, but several have come out, but this is the most important one that occurred in the United States. It happened in uh, 1977. We published the Dietary Goals of the United States, often known as the McGovern Report. This was an extensive study that was done by George McGovern, a Democrat. And what his group did is they, uh, they looked at the nutritional literature up to that time and made some really important conclusions. Uh, they, they concluded that ischemic heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and hypertension are the diseases that kill us. They're epidemic in our population. We cannot afford to temporize. This is 1977. Treatment, not prevention, has been the order of the day. The problems cannot be resolved merely by more and more medical care. Uh, we're talking about 50 years ago. We have an obligation to inform the public of the current state of knowledge and to assist the public in making the correct food choices. To do less is to avoid our responsibility. Well, you know, if you look at what happened next, you'll see the power of industry. Before the end of 1977, the food industry, through their money and lobbyists, had changed the dietary goals of the United States to where they're meaningless. We were no longer focusing our attention on the animal food industry and the processed food industry. We were basically told Americans they needed a well-balanced diet. You could eat pretty much anything you wanted. So we faced uh, three categories of dietary change for the future. And, and these po potential diet for the future uh, involve problems that we are, can see today. A diet has a tremendous impact on chronic diseases, infectious diseases, and climate change. Diet is the common denominator for all three of these important societal changes that threaten our lives. And understanding the importance of diet gives us something that we can do. It's not some esoteric thing. Each individual has an opportunity to change their diet, to improve their health, to reduce their risk of infectious diseases, and to make at least some impact on the climate. The question is, what are you gonna do for the 21st century? How are you going to apply your skills, your knowledge of diet to these important areas of health and survival? Chronic diseases. Nearly 80% of people in affluent societies have chronic diseases. Why do I say 80%? Because if you look at the statistics in the United States, you find that nearly 80% of people are either overweight or obese. Now, even in China, 12 to 14% of the people have diabetes and half the population of China is pre-diabetic. So it is all over the world. Chronic diseases are diseases caused by rich foods, and they include all kinds of problems that you see in friends and neighbors, 
obesity, type 2 diabetes, atherosclerosis, high blood pressure, autoimmune diseases, kidney and liver problems, and of course, dementia. No disease that can be treated by diet should be treated by any other means. This is a proverb I think we could live by. But anyway, you, you, you cure the chronic diseases uh, by changing diet, just like, just like uh, Dennis Burkett and Roy Swank and Walter Kepler taught us. Uh, as far as infectious diseases go, we learned the importance of diet when it comes to infectious diseases by what happened to us in uh, 2019, the COVID worldwide pandemic. Uh, what was quickly discovered is uh, many people had an asymptomatic disease or a mild disease, but there were folks who went on to have a life-threatening disease. And when it was uh, when it was looked for the cause of the, the patients going on to serious illnesses that resulted in hospitalizations and the need for a ventilator and dying. When it came to determining the difference between people who did well survived this disease with little consequence and those who it was a terminal event, what they found was it had to do with their diet. Anthony Fossey, the head of the National Institutes of Health, he says whether or not you have serious consequences, hospitalization, intubation, and death relate very strongly to the prevalence and incidence of underlying comorbid conditions, whether or not you're overweight, diabetic, have kidney disease, or heart disease. Those who do, their future is one dominated by viral diseases and other kinds of diseases that, in a battle that you're going to lose. And the thing to realize is that, you know, COVID-19 is just one pandemic. There are more pandemics, pandemics to come. You know, this is our future. And the Earth's climate and diet. Uh, I think this statement uh, is one that we should carry with us. The climate emergency is a race we are losing, but it is a race we can win. We have to believe that, otherwise it becomes so overwhelming for us that we have a tendency to give up. But we have things that we can do to preserve the planet's health. When you realize that half the greenhouse gases are a consequence of the animal agriculture businesses, and research shows that if you decide to change from a Western eating pattern to a vegan diet, you have the potential to reduce your production of CO2 by 50 to 80% overnight. You get frustrated by recycling and uh, driving an energy efficient car and you wanted to know if you could do more. Well, you can do more you can make this kind of dietary change yourself individually, personally, or you can get your family to do it or your community to do it. You know, spread the good news. We can make an impact by changing our diet. So we're faced with uh, pretty serious uh, problems in our future. Uh, we have the threat of annihilation from atomic wars. But I've lived with that for the last 76 years. You know, since the explosion of the atomic bombs uh, during World War II, we've worried that we're going to end the world with this kind of power. I mean, as a little kid, I was taught to hide under my desk at school in case of a, an atomic blast. Well, you know, we still have that threat. We do. But we have an additional threat that may be even more concerning to people, and that is the warming of the planet. We've got to do something. The greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. We've got to do something. So what, could, what can we do? Do we have the will to act even though we have the knowledge to save ourselves? Do we have the will to act? Can we do this? Is this just useless information that I just provided for you? Or is there a possibility that we can make a worldwide change? Well, we've done it in the past. There have been people in the past who've had the will to change. Well, this happened during World War I in Denmark. The people who lived in Denmark, 
they made dramatic changes to their diet to prevent starvation. That was a consequence of the British blockade between England and Germany. That sea blockade prevented Denmark from getting supplies and food. And as a result, they were, they were facing the threat of starvation. I mean, 400,000 Germans suffered and died due to malnutrition during these war years. Well, the Germans, uh, what they did is they followed a well-balanced diet. They made sure that um, the population was relegated a certain amount of foods that would provide calcium, in other words, dairy, and foods that would provide protein, in other words, animal foods. And but that's how they decided to go through the war. And they're just plain and simple, it wasn't enough food. But the people in Denmark came to another conclusion, thanks to a research a scientist, a very famous doctor. His name is Mikhail Hindi. Uh, Mikhail Hindi, he, he uh, had ties with the Danish government during World War I. And because he was a nutritionist, understood the importance of food, realized that there was no possibility of developing protein deficiency. You know, the need for protein in the human being is so low that it's virtually impossible to design a diet that's too low in protein. He knew this. And so what the uh, he and the British government advised was for people to stop eating the animals. You didn't need animals for protein or calcium. Stop eating the animals and instead eat the foods that the animals were eating. You know, the potatoes, the grains, the soybeans. And so what that's what the people ate. You know, the pigs starved. The people didn't. In fact, the people thrived. Not only did they thrive, they, they improved their health during these war years. During this time of kind of food restriction, not amount of calories, but the kinds of foods that they consumed, it resulted in a 34% reduction of diseases throughout Denmark. This, this is a statistic that they've not had, enjoyed be, before World War I and after World War I. Only during World War I did they see this dramatic reduction due to the change in diet. They stopped eating the animals. They started eating the animals' food. Well, at the same time, going back to the infectious disease problem, we had another infectious disease going throughout the world. This was the Spanish flu. Well, the Danes changed their diet. The Germans didn't. At that time, nearly 100 years ago, we had effective ways to deal with viruses. These were public health measures. Face masks, social distancing, contact tracing. That's what they did 100 years ago. They even attempted vaccines. Didn't seem to make any difference, but what did make a difference was what people ate at that time in Western Europe. You see the dramatic reduction in deaths from Spanish flu in Denmark compared to Germany because they changed their diet and protected themselves from serious complications of this virus. Now, back 100 years ago in World War I, we had communication you know, mouth to mouth. Uh, we had a few telephones. We had the, uh, the telegraph. We had the telegraph since the 1500s. You know, when the telegraph came around, uh, we had what was known as the Renaissance period, uh, 300 years of prosperity. 300 years of, uh, of people making progressive changes in the way we lived and what we thought in our art, science, and politics. That's what happened after the introduction of the printing press for 300 years. So now here we are, 1914 to 1919, World War I. And we have a telephone, we have a telegraph, we can talk to each other. And yet these 3 million people changed their diet and saved their country. What do we have today? We have instantaneous communication with almost everybody on planet Earth. 85% of the population of a planet has a smartphone. So the potential is there to share important information worldwide instantaneously. But we're facing some serious problems. 
wouldn't it be wonderful if we took our modern technology and it resulted in changes similar to what the printing press resulted in? Instead of a time of complete destruction of planet Earth, what if we made it a time of enlightenment? Another renaissance for the next 300 years. Can we do that? Yeah, I know many people say no, but I can't come to that conclusion. It would cause me to give up. The potential is there. I've seen changes take place, major changes in the way people behave in my lifetime at 76 years old. What has happened? It used to be when I was growing up, smoking was normal behavior. Even as a young doctor, I would go into the doctor's lounge and over half the doctors were smoking. You had to cut the air to breathe in the room. And then Luther, Luther Terry came out in 1964 and gave us the truth, the information about tobacco, smoking and health in the United States. And the consequence was that people in the United States stopped smoking. They went from half the Americans smoking to fewer than 17% smoking. So we can make behavioral changes that are important worldwide if we provide the information. Similar, we had changes that were induced by another Surgeon General, C. Everett Koop. They tried to get us to change our diet, trying to reinforce the dietary goals of the United States that McGovern had started. But again, at that time, the industry was just too powerful. C. Everett Koop made a mark on alcohol. It used to be that if you go to a typical uh, noontime lunch with business associates, you had two or three martinis before you could start conducting business. Now it's a, it's a social disgrace. We've started another movement and that has to do with food. We've started that in the 21st, 20th century. We've got to finish it in the 21st century. That is to get people to make a change in behavior so that when you walk in a restaurant and you look at the neighbor's table and you see animal foods on their table and you go, ah, that's disgusting. Just like being drunk at lunch was disgusting. Just like smoking tobacco was disgusting. We can change our behavior. I know we can, but will we? Well, we're going to change. I, I don't know what your philosophy is, and it really doesn't much matter. You know, change is inevitable. And we're going to change from a world where animal products are consumed by billions of people to one where we go back to people eating a starch-based diet. Instead of the animal foods, they get their calories, the protein, the vitamins and minerals. They get them from starches. Well, we can get there in a couple of different ways. The one, we can uh, look back at uh, human history and realize that uh, over basically all of human history, large populations of successful people have attained the bulk of their calories from starch. I gave you the examples of the Aztecs and the Mayans in Central America. The Native American in Southwest United States lived on potatoes. We're talking about people who originally occupied our particular lands. They lived on a diet of potatoes and corn. We talked about the Asian living primarily on rice. We could go back to this old style of eating. The new style of eating has only been around for about 50 to 150 years. It's only been 50 to 150 years that we've been able to, you know, as, as a world population, eat like kings and queens. We had the Industrial Revolution, and we had the harnessing of fossil fuels. We spread the information on how to destroy ourselves and our planet around the world by switching from a diet that was based on starch to a diet based on animal foods. We could do that with the correct information. Or we could be forced to change, which you know, many of us think is more likely because of wars, droughts, rising temperatures. Growing a food is become, going to become more difficult. But in this case, we'll be forced to, to eat a simple diet rather than choosing. We'll be sacrificing rather than doing something that benefits us and the planet. So dietary change is up in front of us. You choose where you want to put your efforts. I say education. 
and spreading the good news and the truth. I found the most effective way to get people to uh, eat a starch-based diet is to talk about their ancestors. You know, you talk about what their, their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents ate. And they'll come to the conclusion that this is my normal native diet. I should be proud of this. This is my heredity. This is this is the uh, this is the diet of my ancestors. Don't don't try and sell this as a vegan diet or vegetarian diet or whole food plant based diet. These are two unfamiliar terms, but you could say to people, well, say they're from. Central America, you could say, well, how about corn and beans and squash? Well, no, that's what grandma and grandpa used to eat. Well, how are they? Oh, they were trim and healthy into their 90s. Well, how about rice and vegetables? Oh, that's what grandma and grandpa ate. And they're still active in, in their 80s and 90s and good health. And the people that relate to what's going on in their families, they still have the information. They realize not only is this a possibility, but this is a preferred possibility. It tastes great. So encourage people to eat the diet uh, that they're familiar with. Focus on ethnic ethnicities. You got the point. All right, well, we're also facing uh, the, the, the possibility, the decision as to where we're going to go in terms of medical care. You know, for chronic diseases, medical care is really lacking. For acute problems like infections, broken bones, lacerations, et cetera. You know, we do a wonderful job with these acute episodes that occur in people's lives that cause devastation and death. But these are the acute problems like the accidents and the infections. But what do we accomplish when it comes to chronic disease, the obesity, the chronic constipation, the indigestion, the diabetes? What have we accomplished with pills? More people are on pills today than ever been on in the past. There are more different kinds of pills than ever been in the past. And we've developed a medical business where what we do, and people don't hide this. They, they, the, the people in established medicine, they seem to even brag about it, is what we have as a practice of medicine today is something called managed care. What we do is manage these people. We don't try and get them well. We don't look for a possibility of a cure. We just switch them from one type of drug to another. Or if they fail at one surgery, they go on to the next. We manage their disease. We keep it and manage it. The, the other possibility for those in the healthcare business is you could reverse the disease. And what I mean is you could cure the problem by stopping the cause. I mean, that's what Pritikin did. Swank and Kempner. That's what I've been doing for the last 47 years is I've been changing people to the rich Western diet that's making them sick and obese to a starch-based diet that our ancestors have consumed for, well, let's just guess a million years. So we have some choices to make and hopefully governments and medical establishments will see the value of, of spreading good health and the truth rather than making people more money and keeping a business going that uh, hurts everybody, pretty much. Except those that are selling the products that are so useless. Uh, my interest in climate change started approximately 19 years ago when my first grandson was born. But our work goes back uh, to 1947 in diet. We wrote a book called Making the Change. That's the first book we wrote back in the late 70s. Wrote a book called uh, Making the Change. That was the title of the book because I knew back then, you know, 55 years ago, I knew that the problem would be making the change. It wasn't a question of whether people would get healthier or the planet would, uh, would be able to thrive under better conditions. It was, well, could I make people, could I get people to make the change? And so I put together a website. It's uh, it's the McDougallFoundation.org. 
mcdougallfoundation.org that, that's dedicated to helping people make dietary change. And uh, there it offers the information that you need as an individual to change from the Western diet full of animal products and oils and processed foods to a starch-based diet with the addition of fruits and vegetables. All the information is there. It's free. It's open to the public. It's uh, mcdougallfoundation.org. My last message to you, just like my first message back in the late 70s, is make the change from destructive animal food-based diets to plant food-based diets. The ones that are health-supporting for the planet and people. I hope I've been able to share this understanding that I've been able to, to gain over 55 years in medicine and 76 years alive on this planet. Uh, this kind of information could should make a difference for everybody. Let's see what happens. Uh, I'm Dr. John McDougall, and my website is drmcdougall.com. Well, your work is invaluable, you know, and I, I think one of the interesting things that, uh, that that you highlighted tonight and, you know, we've, we've all dealt with for so long, and that is that it's not an issue of there not being any science. The science is overwhelming, you know, yeah. and so people have this illusion that the science is supporting the standard American diet, when in fact, it's 360 degrees out well, of the it's, other it's direction. 100%, it's 100% the opposite. Yeah, but, yeah. but see, you you guys know just about the diet. I know about the medical care. Yeah, and like for example, all the studies on heart surgery show no survival benefit. Right. The only randomized trial ever published was just published last year on colonoscopy. It was done in Europe, eighty five thousand people in Poland, Norway. They did a randomized control trial on colonoscopy. No survival benefit after 10 years. Amazing. Yeah. It just, it's just 100% they are wrong. They're not just occasionally wrong. They're 100% wrong. And it's without any difficulty to prove them wrong if anybody will listen. The problem I've had is the money talks. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And very loudly. <laughs> Well, to the point where it's destroying the world and it's destroying our yeah. kids' future. Yeah. So yeah. I'm glad you guys yeah. are in that battle. It's a big deal. So we're excited. So well, uh, that... again, any any time you you two could get me involved. Yes, I'm absolutely. All, I'm, I'm always available. I would even get up in the middle of the night for you two. <laughs> <laughs> I know so, you would. Uh, you're a, you're an absolute you, star. Yeah.